So, welcome to the Oxford uh, Cath Labs. We, uh, this is my colleague Raj Kabanda. We have our team with us today uh, who are going to show a case of a lady who's got significant aortic stenosis. She's on the waiting list for TAVI and the diagnostic angiogram um, has shown disease both of the right coronary and the left main. Um, Raj, do you want to just talk us through what our strategy is with regard to coronary disease in patients having TAVI? Yeah, so I think uh, there's been a sort of move to a move away from treating all coronary disease. In Oxford, our practice is to treat uh, either very severe uh, proximal disease, essentially, that we feel might either have an impact on the procedural safety of the procedure or critical disease that we think is subtending a large area of myocardium. And we've done that largely on angiography and also because of the difficulties in reaccessing the coronaries after a TAVI valve implant. So this lady's got a significant angiographic stenosis in the right coronary. The left main is less clear. Are there reasons why we might use intravascular ultrasound rather than physiology in patients with severe aortic stenosis? Yeah, that's a great question. So to date, as you know, uh, physiology uh, guided intervention is superior to angiography guided intervention in the context of stable disease and increasingly acute coronary syndromes. But in the context of aortic stenosis, as yet, we don't have the data to interpret what those physiological indices mean. And that's largely because the hyperemic indices, we know that in patients with severe aortic stenosis, the hyperemia is impaired, so you're likely to get a false negative FFR. So it's fine if it's positive, but if it's negative, you don't know whether it's because you haven't induced enough hyperemia. So particularly in the left main, particularly in patients with aortic stenosis, uh, imaging may have a slightly increased yeah. role in deciding whether we need to treat. Yeah. So the left main um, angiographically does not look particularly calcified. Uh, as we've discussed, assessment of the ex extent of calcification with angiography is difficult. We're intending to use intravascular ultrasound to guide our approach to the left main. Yeah. And nearly cranial film. So, I mean, it's a good case, and <laughs> it's quite difficult to be uh, dogmatic about the level of obstruction there. Uh, yeah. There's clearly some tapering of the left main proximal to that trifurcation. Uh, there is some disease of the ostium of the LED, which is not critical. Uh, go back one for me, Phil. And there is some involvement at the ostium of the circuit intermediate. Um, all, th all of those elements seem quite difficult to, to yeah, assess. Think, well, it, it's, it's the, the recognising that angiography is not good at the left main usually, the distal left main. Uh, it, it's one of the Achilles heels, I think, of angiography. You can take lots of views, but often you won't open up those complex trifurcations or that segment. And this is a, a good illustration of that, isn't it? Yep. So I think if we do our first IVUS down the LED, yep. so we want to see what the LED looks like, what the left main looks like, yep. and we can see where we are. Okay, let's look for me. So I think we'll just do the prox LED left main, yeah? So, Gianluigi, you're going to talk us through what you can see. So let's start pulling back, please. So essentially, <laughs> on the pullback from the LED, I think that we need to address four main questions. The first one is about the ostium of the LAD, which looked okay on the angiogram, but actually might be um, <coughs> clearly diseased on the, uh, on the IVUS, and probably the same thing should be done on the CERC. The second thing that we need to address is the distal reference, in order to size the stent, uh, back in the guide, and the proximal reference, and the length of the stent as well. Especially in this case, knowing which is the actual length of the disease is going to be quite helpful in order to have a proper lens sizing because we, don't, we want to cover the ostium, but we don't want to come too much back into the aorta considering that this patient is supposed to go for a TAV intervention. So I'm moving here on the distal reference we are on the LAD. It's pretty circumferential and what I want to know now at the moment are approaching the ostium of the LAD just to understand firstly what is, what is the actual minimal lumen area at that point and secondly the <coughs> amount of calcification because the other point that we need to understand if this patient needs a rotablation assisted PCI or not. So what I can see here, so this is the true ostium and actually it is very interesting to show that here we've got 
the minimum luminary at the ostium of the LED is 2.7. So we were discussing before that on the angiogram the LED looks fine at the ostium. Actually, the iris is showing us that it's not. Firstly, secondly, when we approach more proximally, here we are right at the carina of the bifurcation. I probably glad to confirm that the amount of calcification is not massive. So probably the, the strategy of um, considering not an upfront rotablation for this specific case might, might actually pay. So the amount of calcification is probably deep according to if you look at the angiogram, but definitely is not uh, 360 degrees or more than 270 degrees our uh, calcific catch. So you can see the circumflex wire coming in at 10 o'clock there. Uh, the other thing that we use in the uh, IVAS algorithm for the left main is essentially to try and reassess the categorization of the lesion. So I think uh, what we see there is that the left circumflex ostium is uh, it's not, certainly not critically diseased, but an intravascular ultrasound will help us guide that categorization, won't it? So what we're going to do is do a second intravascular ultrasound of the circ and see whether this is a 111 lesion, meaning osteal disease of uh, LED and circ as well as the distal main, or whether the circ itself is spared. And that will then inform a strategy of single stent or double stent. So is that all flushed through, Rush? Yes, yeah. it is, yeah. Okay. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, that doesn't want to go down, so that's a bit disappointing. So that kind of speaks to the level of comp lack of compliance of the vessel, really, mm. that uh, we often see that in the main, but the guide, without certainly some treatment, the, uh, the catheter doesn't want to go down there. So I think uh, as a consequence of that, what we're going to do is we're going to treat this lesion as a, uh, with a provisional strategy. So let's have a 3015 balloon, please. So based on the IVUS, we do not think we need to rotablate. Uh, that said, we still want to be sure that we've got uh, complete expansion of the balloon. And Jan, uh, can you tell us a stent length from the intravascular ultrasound? Uh, I'm working at that. Okay. So according to IVUS, okay. I've got yep. a minimum length of going up. 27. 3-0 balloon going up, left main to LAD. And that looks well expanded. So based on the findings of the IVA so far, we think a provisional approach with a stent size to the distal vessel followed by pot should be the optimal approach. Is that correct, John? Yes. So let's have a, uh, what did you want? What, si what, what size is the reference so this study, distal? This study I measured a reference of 2.6. Okay. Diameter. Diameter. Okay, so give me a three. Um, can I just see the angiogram? And what's the length again, Jan? Back again. So I've got a length of 27 and approximately is 4.5, for 4.6. Yeah. So it's a slight yeah. concern really with views the Resolute that we've got the wrong platform in there. Yeah. yeah. So we're just going to change our approach here a little. One of the important things for us to consider is how you manage the transition of stents. There is some disease in the LED beyond the diagonal. Uh, I recognize we haven't pre-dilated that, but I'm going to stent that and stent back um, to around about the origin of the uh, first septal with this stent. And then we will come back with a 3.5, which will be appropriately sized after pot uh, in order to make sure we optimize this result. Going up, this is the 3.0.38 Resolute on extent, mid LAD, 14 bar. And down, and that distal lesion has expanded well. Going up, 3522, left main ostium to LAD. You give me 16, 18 there. And you're happy jailing the wire, which yep. uh, I know we've discussed that numerous times, but uh, at okay. 18 bar for 15 seconds. Again, short inflations. Want to make sure it's well expanded, but given the aortic stenosis, we don't want to have prolonged ischemia time. Yeah, it okay, looks I like nice, that. Yeah. Okay. Save that fluoro for me. Let's go there. So give me 16 there. Going up with the 4-0 balloon. This is at the Carina. This is the pot, the proximal optimization. 18. That's 18 bar on the 4-0. And down. And again, we just need to optimize the... So it's still got that wire in, but I'm, I'm reasonably happy with that. Yeah. Let's, let's go again there. Going up. 18, 20. This is the ostium of the left main. That's 20 bar with the 4-0 balloon. 
That looks very nice, doesn't it? The size of that looks right. And so the result in the main looks good. Based on the angiogram, you would say we've got good expansion in the main itself. There's a lucency within the um, ostial cirque mm. uh, and intermediate, which is very difficult to characterise angiographically, isn't it? Mm. We're not going to get an ibis catheter down over that wire, obviously, because that wire no. is, is trapped. So I think what we'll do is we'll see if we can wire that cirque with a new wire, yeah. pre-dilate the struts, and see if we can get an ibis down and see what's going on. Yeah. We've pre-dilated with a small balloon the ostium of the cirque through the left, through the stent, and we're going to see. So that ibis catheter has mm. gone through very easily. Mm. So what we've just done, Jan, is we've just done an ibis of the ostium of the circumflex. You just pull that back for us and let's see what we can see. So, yeah, so I'm pulling back the run that we just yeah. done on the on the cirque. So I'm running back in the circ here at this point. The vessel is not massive in diameter, as you can see, and it's not heavily diseased. We are approaching the ostium of the circ, the true ostium of the circ. Yep. And I think it's going to be very helpful to look also the longitudinal reconstruction. So we are at this point, so that's the ostium of the circ. You can see the intermediate coming here at 2 o'clock. And at this point, I, I took a measurement before of the ostium of the circ, which was 3.7. In a vessel bearing in mind which the reference diameter was 2.6. Uh, so we are approaching here the polygonal convergence and what we've done with the uh, ballooning before we actually scaffolded the first stand provisionally implanted in the left domain to the LAD towards the ostium of the circ. And you can see here a bit of crowded stand struts. Okay so what I'm thinking here we've got a true trifurcation. Um, we have a modest sized AV circ. I want that 3 or balloon please. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a, a balloon inflation uh, at the ostium of this intermediate terminal left main prox LED and just see whether with that we can optimize the result in all three vessels. I think when you're doing intermediate, uh, thank you, when you're doing trifurcation lesions you need to optimize uh, at least decide a ranking of which vessels are the most important. Um, in this, geographically, the intermediate is the second largest vessel. Okay, so we've got two balloons in there, intermediate and LED. We're going to go up to six on both. Are you ready? Yeah, it's going up. Left main, kiss into the intermediate. That's six. Eight on both. Eight on both. One, two, three. Down. And we're down. So we're going to take these balloons out, we're going to do another ibis in the intermediate. Mm. So what we're going to do now is we're going to do an intravascular ultrasound of the intermediate. Okay, so I'm taking a measurement of the polygonal convergence, which used to be 2.7 before after kissing balloon, we are 9.2. So we actually satisfy the kind criteria at that point. I can show here the ostium of the intermediate, which is absolutely intact. And you've got the circ coming there at six, uh, sorry, uh, nine o'clock. Excuse me. Chan. And that's the polygonal convergence. There you can see how the stent actually has been very nicely scaffolded to open actually towards the ostium of the circ. And as I told you before, the measurement at that point is 9.2. And I can confirm once again that the stent in the left main is very rounded in shape, well opposed, well expanded. I'm not sure if we need another pot here, actually. Uh, the result is looking very, very good. We missed the very, very proximal end of the left main because the, the guy... Was we saw that in the previous one, didn't we? Yes. And that really looked... So we'd absolutely nailed the, uh, yes. the ostium, I think. Yes. So that's been a great case. What we've shown here is in a patient with uh, severe aortic stenosis, the intravascular ultrasound can be used to uh, plan a procedure. It confirmed the need for, for intervention. It guided our choice of uh, stent. It reassured us that we didn't need to do lesion preparation. And we then used the intravascular ultrasound post-stenting to optimize the stent expansion, particularly in this complex trifurcation. So it's been a great example, I think, of how to uh, undertake intervention in a sequential, careful approach, and ultimately to end up avoiding uh, using a second stent, which I think is beneficial in this patient. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Carl Banda, who's helped me. Rachel has been doing a great job. Mr. Martindale, who's just run into the corner. Dr. Gianluigi Di Maria here, 
Rich and the rest of the team. Bernie's down there. Uh, Paul's hiding behind there. But the Oxford team for putting on uh, what's been a great case. And I hope it's been very educational. Thank you very much. Innovation and you. Philips.